thank you very much, Yoshi, for this nice introduction. It's a pleasure for me to stand here and report about our results of the Zonats project. And the topic is the prevention and treatment of sarcopenic obesity. So you as healthcare professionals or students or also researchers, you hold the key for effective prevention and treatment strategies. And together we can successfully, ultimately, improve patient outcomes. And I think this is the aim of all of us, to improve the outcomes of our patients. But how should we do that? So, um, some slides may, may be fam familiar to you, because also Alf Alfonso and also Eve used them. Um, so, what are our aims when we are working with persons with sarcopenic obesity? The first aim, of course, is to reduce fat mass. We want to maintain muscle mass or even maybe improve muscle mass. We want to reduce myosteatosis. So Eve talked a lot about this fat infiltration in the muscle. We want to improve that. We also want to improve inflammation in the body. And of course, we want to improve the physical function of our patients. And how can we do that? So I will give you a brief overview. Um, the first-line therapy at the moment are nutrition and exercise interventions. For nutrition interventions, we have, for example, the energy-restricted diet and also a high-protein diet. And exercise, we have resistance training, we have aerobic training, we have mixtures of it. Yeah, but we also have pharmacological agents. So. Um, Eve already talked about it, the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists, for example. Um, but you have to say that we really need more research on these uh, pharmacological agents to really can recommend something for persons with uh, sarcopenic obesity. We also have the possibility of medical therapies, for example, giving testosterone, but also here, the studies are a little bit contradictory, and uh, we really need more, more research on that. It's always important to have this personalized approach. This means, in general, to do the right things in the right patient at the right time. It's not always so easy. Um, and this also involves, for example, genomics, or biomarkers, so there is a lot of research uh, in this field about personalized medicine, and it may also help us in the future to treat persons with sarcopenic obesity. And what you also can do, of course, in very obese uh, patients or persons is bariatric surgery. But in my talk, I will focus on nutrition and exercise interventions. Since you heard, I'm a dietitian and I worked uh, for several years in the clinical field, so in the university clinic in Austria. And this is, of course, my favorite topic <laughs> to speak about. I would like to introduce you to Ella, Mrs. Ella. She was a participant in our pilot study, in our SoNuts so pilot study. And she came to us and she lived with her husband at home. She was 62 years old. She had children, grandchildren. But she also complained a little bit that she gained weight during the last years. And her wish was to lose weight. This was why she participated in our study. And she didn't know exactly how to do that. And yeah. Uh, here you can see her um, measurements, the results. So she had a very high BMI, 38.3. And you can also he see here the muscle uh, parameters or functionality parameters, grip strength, for example. We measured the chest and test, uh, gait speed, and also muscle mass. And if you apply in the next step this algorithm, you all know it now, that's very good. If you apply that to Mrs. Ella, you can see uh, that, yes, there was a high BMI. This was very obvi obvious um, that she has a risk or, yeah, a risk in this uh, category. But she also complained about fatigue and weakness. 
and reduced mobility because she thought it's because of her high weight. So she wanted to be more mobile. And then we went on to the next step. This is then to measure the strength, muscle strength. We did it with um, hand grip strength, but we also did the ha uh, chair stand test. And as you can see here, this was quite normal. In this case, you don't have to go further, uh, usually, but we also measured the body composition with BIA. And we saw that she had increased fat mass, of course, but relatively normal muscle mass. It depends which um, cutoffs you are using. So in this case, Mrs. Ella was obese, but there was no sarcopenia. So the aim here was or is to prevent sarcopenic obesity. She is obese, but we don't want that she is becoming also sarcopene. So how can we uh, do that? What do the guidelines say? I think you all know what the obesity guidelines say, um, which I just give you a brief overview. So most of the guidelines recommend energy restriction, and yeah, it reaches from 500 to 1,000 kilocalories a day, so reduction of 500 to 1,000, or a weight loss of 5 to 15 percent of the body weight, or some guidelines also recommend to lose weight uh, 0.5 to 1 kilo a week. Then all the guidelines recommend uh, physical activity, and mostly they recommend aerobic exercise in combination with resistance training. Then some guidelines also say that, okay, you should combine exercise and energy restriction together, so nutrition intervention and exercise intervention. One guideline said uh, you need an individualized nutritional therapy provided by a registered dietitian. I was very happy when I, when I read it, but uh, then in the columns, when available. So <laughs> it's a little bit like, okay, if accidentally there is a dietitian somewhere around, you can also ask a dietitian. Um, then this is very good that most of the guidelines also include psychological aspects. So they say consider uh, psychological aspects, aspects like stress or depression, and also use multi-component psychological interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy and so on. And the guidelines also say it's not enough to look at the nutrition and exercise of the patients, but at the whole lifestyle. So this includes also, for example, stress management or sleep. So we know that it's very important if you want to lose weight, you have to sleep. Um, you have to have a good sleep quality. Yeah. And now I will show you what we found in our uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And I would like to start with a network meta-analysis. So um, we... You can see here the inclusion criteria. We included community-dwelling persons with overweight or obesity near retirement age, so this was between 55 and 70 years. So this is perfect for our case. Mrs. Ella was 62 years, so it's exactly this target group. And yeah, the interventions, we looked at any nutrition and exercise intervention and control was no intervention or any other intervention, and we looked at different outcomes. And at the end, we had, so I think we screened 9,000, more than 9,000 studies. We included, finally, 92 studies. And in these 92 studies, we had 82 two different interventions. So this shows that uh, studies are very heterogeneous, also in the interventions they apply. And they want to test, and so we had to cluster the interventions into groups. And you can see the groups here. So, for example, we compared everything against no intervention, of course. And then we have, for example, energy restriction. So the green interventions are nutrition interventions. Then we have uh, exercise interventions, and then we have combined interventions. So where a nutrition intervention was combined with exercise. Um, maybe I have to add that in a network meta-analysis, you have a big advantage. So in a 
normal common meta-analysis, you can compare two groups, for example, uh, a group with energy restriction against a group with resistance training. Hmm? But in a network meta-analysis, you really have the chance to compare every intervention we have here against each other. You will see it in my next slide, I think, yes. Uh, here we have the forest plot, and you see um, the outcome here is body fat in kilograms. So you can see on one figure what works for losing body fat in kilo. And as you can see here, the first one, two, three, four, five interventions are energy restriction in combination with any kind of training. So this works very, very well to lose body fat. Um, energy restriction alone here is also working to a little bit lower extent, but here resistance training and high protein, for example, is not really working for losing body fat or resistance training alone. Yeah, yeah, it's still significant, but aerobic training alone, for example, not so much or intermittent fasting. Uh, I have to apologize for this slide. I don't know why the quality is bad, but I think you can see it because it's a large screen. Um, this is the outcome, lean body mass. And we have here the standardized mean difference, and you can see also on, on one view that we have three interventions here that really tend to lose muscle. So this was energy restriction alone, or persons that did energy restriction with high protein, or persons that did energy restriction with aerobic training. So it's not significant, but you can see it's really not perfect because they tend to lose muscle mass. And here you have a lot of intervention where you can maintain muscle or even improve muscle. For example, if you combine energy restriction and resistance training, um, you can see here that the tendency to maintain or even improve muscle is, is very high. So, uh, when you again think of Mrs. Ellers, <laughs> our participant in the SONAT study, um, what should we recommend to her? Based on our work, we can say that we would recommend her energy restriction in combination with resistance training. So this is what the studies say. Or she could also do energy restriction with mixed exercise, for example, so a mixture of aerobic and resistance training. Or she could also do energy restriction with exercise and high protein. So this is what you can recommend. But what you should not recommend to Mrs. Ella, because it either decreases the lean body mass, so it de decreases uh, muscle mass, or it do not reduce body fat. This would be energy restriction alone. And from my experience, it's very often in the clinical practice that we recommend energy restriction to obese persons. But if they are in this age group, so retirement age, um, here 55 to 70 years, it's really not a good idea to recommend energy restriction alone. So um, I think we, there is no way around working together, different uh, professionals, to really um, yeah, get the best out for our patients. What we also cannot recommend to Mrs. Ella is energy restriction and aerobic training. Unfortunately, it's not very um, effective for the muscle. And a lot of women like aerobic training. They like walking or something. And resistance training is often more difficult to, to really include in the daily life. Aerobic training alone is also not really a good idea. Um, because you cannot maintain your muscle, intermittent fasting, and also resistance training with a high-protein diet. This helps, of course, to maintain muscle, but Mrs. Ella also wants to lose weight and fat mass, so it's not enough to do that. I have a second uh, example here from our SONAT study. 
a pilot study, it's Mr. John, and he was 64 years. He came to us because his uh, daughter called us that he should change something. He, he's also very obese. Uh, 38.5 was the BMI. And he was also a little bit um, depressed or sad because his wife died some years ago. And he did not a lot of exercise or, or no exercise. He had problems with the knees and so on. And yeah, as you can see here, um, we found that the grip strength was a little bit below uh, the recommended levels, so not far, but yeah. And also gait speed and the muscle mass it was a little bit um, lower than it should be. And if you again apply this algorithm, you can see, yes, okay, we have again the, this high BMI. We also have this weakness and also um, osteoarthritis, so he had problems in mobility. So we go on to the next step. This is to measure hand grip strength or chair stand test. And we have seen, okay, this is a little bit low, a little bit low. So we moved on to the second step here. And we also found we didn't do DEXA like here on the picture, but we did BIA. And we found that he also had, of course, increased fat mass, but also um, reduced muscle mass. So in this case, you have to go one step further. You have to also stage the sarcopenic obesity. So there are two stages. Um, you have either no complications, which from my experience is, is not very often the case in these patients. And we have also here diabetes, we have osteoarthritis, so a lot of uh, complications. So this person, uh, Mr. John, is in stage two sarcopenic obesity. So <clears throat> we aim to treat him um, for his sarcopenic obesity. So it's a little bit different. Mrs. Ella was only obese. And in, um, in the older age or retirement age, here we have both obesity and sarcopenia, so sarcopenic obesity. And I will show you in the next slides what the literature says or what we found out in our um, literature searches. So we did a systematic review and meta-analysis with studies uh, in persons that are already sarcopenic obese. So inclusion criteria was persons with sarcopenic obesity. And again, the age range 50 to 70. So again, perfect for our patient in this case. And you can see here, it's a big difference. So the, there are not a lot of available studies that include uh, persons with sarcopenic obesity. We found 11 studies. Uh, and nine were included in the meta-analysis. And I marked this here, resistance training, because this is certainly the most studied intervention. I think you already saw this also uh, in Eve's presentation. Um, we did meta-analysis, and I just show you two or three. So the effect of resistance training. So resistance training, we could really do meta-analysis. For nutrition interventions, we couldn't do any meta-analysis because the nutrition interventions were so heterogeneous, and it was only, I think, it, only three studies that um, studied really nutrition interventions in sarcopenic obese persons. However, uh, you can see here, that resistance training worked. Here you have a significant um, reduction in body fat in percent in persons with sarcopenic obesity compared to no training. This is the effect of resistance training on muscle mass, and you can also see here significant improvement. So it's also helping uh, for the muscle mass, but you can also see here it's only three studies, and we should be very careful with giving recommendations based on very few studies. And here we did another meta-analysis um, on body fat or with outcome body fat in kilos. Um, we compared resistance training in combination with protein, high protein diet and resistance training alone. And we found a little bit of better outcomes with regard to body fat when you combine resistance training and um, protein intake, high protein intake. 
And we also did an umbrella review. For all those who don't know what an umbrella review is, we um, searched for systematic reviews, so already published systematic reviews, and tried to summarize them. This was very difficult. <laughs> uh, I will show you why. So we included four systematic reviews and looked at the, at the results. And it's a little bit contradictory. You can see here, for example, it's again only resistance training. We have no data for nutrition interventions, unfortunately. Resistance training, two of four systematic reviews found an effect in body fat. One out of two systematic reviews found an effect of uh, fat mass in kilos. And for muscle mass, it's not really clear. But what we also found, and you can see it also here in this line or column, we also um, graded <laughs> the, the interventions uh, to know how is our confidence in evidence. So this means if there are newer studies coming out, will they change um, our recommendations or the, or the results? And it's very likely that if we have more studies, that the results will change. So the confidence in evidence was mostly here very low, low, moderate. And also the systematic reviews we found on sarcopenic obesity were of low quality. You can see that here. We um, did it with AMSTA and it's critically low to low to moderate. So to summarize <laughs> all these um, literature and, and evidence, we can say we would recommend, based on current evidence, resistance training, because this is the most studied interventions, we have to say that, and in the studies it was two to three times a week for 20 to 60 minutes. We can also recommend combined training, or also this whole body electro-stimulation. Um, there are some studies about that, so you see, that uh, it's mainly exercise, what we know at the moment, what, what is effective. What we cannot recommend, just uh, supplement protein and thinking that this improves your muscle, this will not work. Or also aerobic training will not work. Maybe a combination of exercise and increased protein could work. Uh, we didn't find any studies that, uh, that studied energy restriction in these patients with sarcopenic obesity in combination with others. So we don't know if, if this works, but for sure in our clinical practice um, it's very likely that we recommend uh, exercise in combination also with nutrition interventions. But based on the lit literature we cannot really recommend anything. But you have to be careful, a lack of studies of high quality and the number of primary studies is low and the confidence in evidence is low. Yeah, this is what we found in the literature. And when you are working with patients, I think the aim is always to improve their outcomes, but not only for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or like in studies, six weeks often, but to maintain long-term changes. And this is something which is very often forgotten when we are um, talking about interventions. And we, oh, we know that only 20% of overweight individuals are successful in long-term weight, uh, are, are successful long-term weight losers. This means that when you turn it around, 80% of our patients are not successful weight losers after one year. This long term is defined after one year. But the literature also says if you can do it for one year and two years, it's very likely that it stays until or long, for a longer time. But, so we have 80% of patients that cannot do it for one year or cannot maintain the, the loss of body mass for one year. So there is a third component besides nutrition and exercise, and this is behavior change. And for me, this behavior change is really essential when we want to implement lifestyle changes. Um, and it's very often forgotten. 
There are uh, behavior change techniques available, for example. We can, so it's also called BCTs, behavior change techniques. We can use, for example, goal setting together with the patient. We can do self-monitoring. We can give feedback. I mean, we all do it in our clinical practice. We support the patient. Social support is also important, or graded tasks. So there are a lot of uh, behavior change techniques we could use, or um, other professionals could use, like psychologists. And we also know if you use these behavior change techniques in your intervention, that this improves the effectiveness of interventions and also the adherence of interventions, because this is key. The adherence to what we recommend um, is key if it works or not. So we were interested in, are these behavior change, change techniques used in studies? Uh, including, that include sarcopenic obese persons. And we looked at these 11 studies, we uh, also included in the other meta-analysis, and we looked at them, if they are using BCTs, behavior change techniques. And <laughs> a little bit what we, what we thought, but here um, we have it black on, on white, the intentional use of techniques that facilitate a behavior change is mostly absent. Only two studies used BCTs intentionally. So what means unintentionally? For example, um, describing what they should do. Um, for example, resistance training um, exercises. This describing is also one BCT. And of course, in a study where you apply resistance training, you describe what they have to do. So this is unintentionally use of BCTs. So, there is a lack of psychological components in intervention studies, and yeah, it's really necessary to call for enhanced multidisciplinary work, also in research. What can we expect in the future? I mentioned that there are not a lot of studies available with sarcopenic obese persons, intervention studies. Uh, there are nearly more reviews than intervention studies available. So, uh, we looked at the clinical trial databases uh, where intervention studies should be uh, registered, should be, <laughs> it's not always the case. Um, and we have to say, so we found, I think, around 40 uh, papers are registered in this databases about sarcopenic obesity, and half of them, around half of them, are intervention studies. And we can expect additional evidence on resistance training, protein supplementation, and multimodal interventions, because um, the intervention studies that are registered uh, will look at them or will study these interventions. But what we also saw is that these registered studies were very, very heterogeneous in the samples, in the interventions. So a lot of different interventions, again. Outcomes. So every study measures different outcomes. So this, of course, um, limits the comparability afterwards. Um, the definitions that are used for sarcopenic obesity, the cutoffs, they are very heterogeneous. So, yeah. This leads me to my conclusion for today. We really um, know now that multimodal interventions show the most promising effects. So this means um, we should always, when we have our patients in front of us, think of nutrition and exercise interventions, but also um, we have to think or include behavior change techniques or behavior change in, in any way. So behavior change, adherence and motivation, and personal contact with patients is crucial, I think. Or studies also show that. And um, our participants in the Sonats pilot study, um, they tested an app, and they told us, yeah, the app is nice, but what really motivated me was, after six weeks, we had again a counseling session or a session together, and this personal contact really motivated me to do something in these six weeks. So, 
uh, I think this personal contact or blended systems are really a good, um, good strategy. Yes, I think this is my main message. We have a lack of RCTs and a low confidence in evidence, unfortunately. The definitions, it was also mentioned by Eve and Alfonso, we have no consistent use of definitions and cutoffs. This is also a problem for comparability. And also the long-term effects of interventions are still to be explored, so we don't know a lot about long-term um, weight loss and in, in this specific patient sample. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Doris. Are, are there any questions? Um... <laughs> yeah, Doris, thank you very much for excellent presentation and for giving us a lot of advice. From my perspective as a clinician, if I hear, you know, the aerobic exercise doesn't matter, it doesn't help, it's really probably not true. It doesn't work probably for these two outcomes which were addressed here in these studies. So muscle loss or well, muscle maintain, maintenance and uh, weight, weight loss or fat loss. This is what we... And younger people, they want to look nice, so they want their body was shaped much better. For older people or the retirement age people or even 70, 80 years old, I'm a geriatrician, so we want to maintain much longer health benefits. And that's what Eve already showed. So it's after half a year of exercise, another half a year is maintained. We did another study, a mid-frail study with uh, patients with frailty and where most of them were overweight at least. And the uh, effect of exercise also was maintained for you know several months after the sessions formally stopped for example so i think we have to really start looking for uh, longer term outcomes for the functional outcomes in older people and in middle age we probably are interested or i am as a clinic i mean i'm a internist geriatrician so i don't want people to die from cardiovascular disease and they probably won't and also the metabolism the metabolic syndrome the dyslipidemia atherosclerosis endothelial dysfunction and all this is actually mixed together so i am really happy that we have these analysis and they were mainly done for our approach in SONATS to select the best possible evidence-based intervention and application. But in general, the question is so, so broad, so each piece is very valuable, but we shouldn't lose the overall you know, the, the, the broader view and the clinical position. So, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much for this comment. It's very important. Uh, and indeed, we have a sample, a specific sample here. So, persons in retirement age, and we looked at the outcomes, body fat or body composition. And of course, what you said, um, there are many, many other things. So, humans are complex. So, of course, we don't know for cardiovascular, or we know aerobic training helps in cardiovascular, for cardiovascular risk. Um, and I do not say that patients should not do that if they really don't want to do resistance training. It's a beginning, a starting point, maybe. You should individualize, of course, the recommendations. And um, yes, of course, in, in this analysis, it was a um, specific sample, specific outcomes, so you always have to be careful to use it for the whole population, of course. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, Doris. Very impressive studies and analysis. So uh, my question is about the bone loss. I mean, because we spoke, of course, about the muscle, but regarding bone loss, uh, shall we get more calcium or uh, vitamin D or uh, <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean so 
I know what you mean, but we didn't look at the specific yeah. questions, so I cannot answer it. Uh, we know that there are a lot of critical nutrients for bone health, and it, it's obviously important to have a good nutrient intake, a balanced nutrient intake, and of course we know that, for example, calcium, vitamin D are important for bone health, but I cannot say anything about the evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially also the physical exercise, because we know that for uh, having a, a bone formation, you need, I mean, to have a, uh, uh, to have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, weight bearing, yeah. So I think it's uh, an important issue too. Yeah, Thank you. It is. Just a short remark and a short question. Uh, the short remark is uh, just to stress the importance of your findings because even if it's logical and very well known, even the uh, caloric restriction alone should not be applied in this age group is a very important message because we m we might be very lifestyle minded or whatever, but this is being applied in clinical practice. So get that message out there. So it's very important that we now have this uh, uh, these papers out in this way uh, also. And my message is also work multidisciplinary. Right. So yeah. Very good message. <laughs> <laughs> and a small question, if we have time enough. Uh, you mentioned intermittent fasting as well. I just saw a recent publication that versus control group, there was one kilogram weight loss, uh, but 75% of that was lean mass, mm -hmm. and 50% was even muscle mass. That's, mm -hmm. I was surprised about that. Yeah. What is your professional opinion on that, not based on systematic review? Well, for some people, it works very, very well to do intermittent fasting uh, because we know we have patients that uh, can either eat the whole uh, chocolate <laughs> or nothing of it. So it's for some people easy to have time frames where they do not eat and then time frames where they do eat. But uh, most of, peop of the persons forget that in this time frame where they can eat, it does matter what they eat. So it's not that they can eat everything that they want. So I think it's important also with intermittent fasting, if it's um, supported by healthcare professionals and um, they have advice from them, it can be a good um, thing to do, a good intervention to do. But to do it alone without any knowledge on nutrition and also exercise, it's maybe, or <laughs> when we are looking at the studies, not that's good for the patients. Um, I have a question, mm -hmm. or a question. Um, it's more uh, that I, you, 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 you mentioned behavior change that's needed uh, to, to, to improve uh, the muscle uh, uh, growth. But I think it's also about an envir environmental change. And it's about uh, the where you live and is it, is it appealing the environment uh, to have an exercise uh, or to, um, uh, to change uh, your, uh, uh, the groceries that you buy. Um, so I think uh, it's, uh, it needs also uh, be aiming to uh, the policy makers. Yeah. to make it more appealing that uh, that you can exercise uh, yeah. safely and uh, uh, well in an, in an attractive uh, environment i totally agree it has to be easy to eat healthy and to do exercise and the environment is a very important factor for that too. in a safe in a safe way mm. also because uh, if I look uh, now in Amsterdam, for instance, uh, most old people don't uh, dare to uh, participate in uh, traffic mm -hmm. because it's uh, getting too dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. So they avoid uh, the, to use the bike, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, I totally use, uh, understand that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it's just an example. Uh, please welcome me. Uh, we will save the further questions for the panel discussion. There is a lot of time there, so please join me now in thanking Doris.